Hi everyone. In this video we're going to recap some important or interesting aspects about Kenneth Koch's The Language of Poetry and Edward Hirsch's How to Read a Poem, specifically through the lens of skills that will help you develop your um, exploratory draft one. I said in the video that introduced the exploratory draft one that the primary mode of development is going to be definition and example. Uh, so you're going to be making some statements about poetry, um, even a broad statement like poetry uses lineation to make meaning. It's a claim. You need to develop that. So you would have to define what you mean by lineation. You would have to explain how lineation creates an effect. You would have to potentially give an example of how a line break has this particular effect to it. So mostly you're going to be relying on definition mode of discourse and example as well. Uh, as you know from our modes of discourse that you can use both the positive and negative approach to definition and example. You can say what I mean by this and you can also say what I don't mean by this or what this means or what this doesn't mean. In terms of example, you can say an example of this is, but the opposite of it is this. So it's not an example of what I'm trying to say. So we're going to look at some of these key features in the two essays, the Kenneth Koch and Edward Hirsch, how they define, um, how they present their examples. And those are the primary things I want to point out. I'll point out a couple of others as well, just to kind of navigate the essays for you by pointing out what technical skills they're talking about at any given point of their essays. And that will be just more uh, pointing out places for you to explore again or look more closely at when you read. Because again, you're trying to explain as much about poetry as you possibly can. All the different technical, technical skills, the different effects, the different ways that poets make meaning or create an emotional response, and just defining that as best you can at this point. So I'm going to pull up a document that has both of the essays um, for us to look at. And I've already done some work ahead of time by kind of adding some comments or highlighting specific areas in bold or, or underline. Um, and um, I'll address these as we go. Um, I'm going to start with the language of poetry um, because it embodies everything uh, or those those different ways to define or give examples that both essays do. So I'm only going to look at this one, but what Kenneth Koch is doing is also something that Edward Hirsch does. And you can always look back to how does a poet make meaning to find um, Hirsch doing these same things. So what I want to point out first is two, one, one primary way that both Koch and Hirsch give definitions, and then also one way that uh, Koch gives examples here. So um, let me let me just set the stage a little bit um, and explain what this essay is about and what its purpose is, and that will make uh, what we're trying to do a little bit clearer. But essentially. The essay here is trying to define poetry and define what the language of poetry is. And we know that because Koch tells us this story that um, a poet, Paul Valeray, made this comment that poetry is a language within a language, and it's known as the language of poetry. Koch then tells us that Valerie let it go at that meaning he didn't expand on it, he didn't define that, he didn't give examples of it. It says he went on to talk about other things. And Koch says, I thought it was worth taking literally and seeing where it might lead. I thought it might explain something important about how poems are written and how they can be read. Basically, he says, Valerie made this claim, poetry is a language within a language, it is its own language. That's a claim, but then didn't develop it. So Koch says, I'm going to develop that. And some of the first, some of the most important or accessible tools that he has to develop that claim are definition and example. So you will read after this statement of purpose is made, after the problem making or context is done, 
paragraph after paragraph of Koch defining what poetry is, explaining how it works, and giving examples of it. But one way I want you to see that he does this is through metaphor. So he's trying to describe what poetry is, and even specifically what the language of poetry is, and what sound is, and what um, imagery is, even what pattern is, or rhythm. And he does it oftentimes with metaphor. I said, I think, early on when we were discussing modes of discourse that metaphor could be a really good way to define or clarify what you mean by something. It's an abstract idea that needs more concrete explanation. We can say the same thing about claims. Claims, they're not necessarily abstract, but they don't have evidence to support them yet, so they need support. They need to be made more specific. And here, we have the first instance of Koch using a metaphor to describe what it is like to learn a language and the excitement that comes with learning that language. So he's not just defining the language of poetry, he's defining what it's like to experience the pleasure of it. And this is probably interesting that it's the first one because what better way to interest your audience about learning the language of poetry if you make a claim early on that it gives quite a bit of pleasure. And that's one of the things that he returns back to often, this idea of pleasure and the music and the enjoyment and the discovery. That's one of the ways in terms of maybe the abstract qualities about poetry that he uses to get them interested. And so here he says, I don't remember clearly that time in my childhood when to speak was an adventure, but I've seen it in other children and I do remember the first year I spent in France, when to speak French language gave me the same kind of nervous sense of possibility, ambition, and excitement that writing poetry has always done. So, metaphor to define what it's like to learn the language of poetry. It's like learning another language. It's nervous. It's full of possibility. It's exciting. It is an adventure. Great use of metaphor to get us interested. Uh, I highlighted this, it can be defined first, because it just points out that he's defining it. What is poetic language? Let me define it, let me define it, let me define it. And I'll come back to this underline in a little bit, but I just wanted to point that out. Let's see, later in the next page, he um, has a reference to the music of poetic language. And music here is going to be a metaphor that he plays off of to make more sense of poetry to his audience. He doesn't develop it fully here, he just calls it music, and we're going to see as we go on more references to it. He's talking about um, sound in this portion. So he's defining first language of poetry, focusing on sound. He says, repetition and variation of sounds, among other things, make the second version meditative, sad, and memorable, whereas the first has no such music to keep it afloat. Now we will return to this place again in places like it, because what he's doing is something interesting with example here, but we're still sticking with this idea of defining through metaphor. He picks out some language and the sound of language to talk about how it creates an effect. And he again uses metaphor to define how that works and what it is. When he's talking about the word sleep, and he says, to sleep means to rest or to be unconscious. And usually that is all it means, but it also has a physical nature. The sounds sl and eep, for example, that can be brought to the reader's attention, like the sound hidden inside a drum that emerges when you hit it with a stick. Great metaphor to define how sound is hidden in specific words and how the reader's attention can be brought to those sounds when they're used appropriately. So we have another metaphor about music here. Um, this is maybe the last one we'll look at when he's talking about what the purpose of poetic language is, he again uses a metaphor. He says, individual words in non-literary prose and in conversation are like persons holding onto a rope and hauling a boat out of the water. 
the practical end, the beaching of the boat, matters infinitely more than the beauty or the graceful movement of the haulers. Poetry makes us aware of the beauty and grace of the words that are hauling in the meeting, so that we have to respond to it both as music and as sense. So, another metaphor about pulling a boat up onto land. How random does that seem? But he's using it to define the difference between non-literary prose and poetry. He uses this idea of hauling a boat in with a rope to do so. It's helping the reader understand this concept better. I actually do want to focus on one more because it's one of my, my favorites. My favorite uses of metaphor that he uses to, dis to define. Right, i got to find it. I think I highlighted it. Um, well, later on, as you see, he still comes back to this metaphor of music, and he also uses a metaphor of other artists and other art forms. Um, raw materials is technically a metaphor. Raw materials could be wood, nails, clay, glue, things like that. He compares poetry to a painter who has paint. Words are like paint. Um, wood or stone is similar to words to a sculptor. He uses this idea of the poetic keyboard. That there's different notes to hit and choose that make certain sounds. So that wasn't the one I was looking for, but just seeing that music metaphor play out. Ah, uh, here it is. He says, language in general is like a car able to go 200 miles an hour, but which is restricted by the traffic laws of prose to a reasonable speed. So we have these rules in prose that we have to abide by, specifically non-literary prose. They're practical and so they don't have much excess to them. 200 miles an hour would be excess. Having traffic laws to keep things at a reasonable speed shows that there's a practicality in mind. And then he says, poets are fond of accelerating. They like to go 200 miles an hour. They like to get the most out of language without restriction. Again, another wonderful metaphor to explain what the language of poetry is, what a poet does, who a poet is, and so forth. And I think this is going to be um, a great skill that you can um, use in the in defense of, sorry, the exploratory draft number one. As you're defining different things, can you use metaphor to make it make more sense? Uh, I believe you can, uh, and you have Kenneth Koch showing you how to do it here. One other thing I want to look at in Koch is his use of examples. So we were just talking about definition mode of discourse. Now let's talk about use of examples and I had highlighted one in bold earlier on yeah it's right here and then I referred to one earlier as well but let me go to the one earlier um, here this is at least where he introduces this concept of example so he's talking about poetic language, what poetic language can do through repetition and variation of sound, how it calls our attention to these sounds, and how those uh, sounds also have emotional qualities. And he technically here gives us an example of the sound of language being used to make meaning and affect the audience emotionally. And it's the second one. This is the poetic language that's from Shakespeare. To be or not to be, that is the question. And he says that the way that the repetition and variation of sounds works with to be, not to be, um, the repetition of the T's, t, not, that, question, very hard on the T's, is mem meditative, sad, and memorable. But then he compares it to another one. This is an example in the negative. This is what that sentence is essentially saying. I don't know whether or not to commit suicide. That's what this Shakespeare quote means. But this example is not an example of poetic language. It has no music to keep it afloat. So he's comparing an example of poetic language to an 
not something that's not an example of poetic language. Same thing happens, um, let's see, when this one down here. He says, one of these is going to have music and the other one will not have music. So a very common thing you might see at a beach. No dogs are allowed on the beach. He says, this is, as far as music goes, pretty much of a blank. The purpose of the sentence is to keep the dogs off the beach. If you read instead, no dogs and no logs are allowed on the beach, or no poodle, however so trim, and no dachshund, unable to swim, you might smile, grow dreary, and begin to dance. But in any case, the, uh, you might lose the practical message. So again, he's still showing that this is an example of poetic language. It doesn't mean it's necessarily good, but it is poetic. It's pushing the limits and boundaries of what language can do. Whereas the first example is, is there's no music to it, it's blank, it's uninteresting, it just has a practical message attached to it. So I point out these as examples of developing a claim. This is what poetic language is. Let me give you an example of it. Let me also contrast that against an example of what it's not. Another great tool for you in the exploratory draft one, and I would like to see you using this skill and also the metaphor to define your terms as well. Um, that's, that's the key points. You can look to Edward Hirsch doing this as well, but I want to point it out here in Coke. The only other thing I want to point out about Coke before we briefly look at Edward Hirsch is that he is talking in general about the language of poetry and he it's a general term for basically all poetic technique or or a couple at least poetic techniques that are on our list of five and i've underlined those here and i'll point them out just so you can make a distinction yourself when is he talking about pattern and rhythm when is he talking about sound when is he talking about um what else is he talking about? Imagery, for instance. And he points them out at different times. So, let's see. First, he starts with the sound. The sound of the words. So he's defining poetic language, and he focuses on the sound of the words. So this is one of our technical skills. And he focuses on this one for a while. This is where a lot of the music metaphors come in, so on and so forth. Now well, I'm going to move down for a little bit. Later, he picks up this idea of rhythm. It's also, rhythm is also in the language of poetry, but it's a specific skill, rhythm, pattern, form. And he goes on to define, explain, and give examples of rhythm. This is for you to read and learn about form and rhythm. Um, later, let's see. Find out where my next underline is. Did I miss it? Oh. After he's talking about sound and rhythm, he says, along with its emphasis on music, poetry language is also notable for its predilection for certain rhetorical forms, such as comparison, personification, and apostrophe. And really here, uh, especially when he's talking about memories, um, really what he's talking about is imagery, inclinations towards the imaginary, the images. And he briefly talks about that. He doesn't talk a ton about it, but it is another one of our technical skills represented here. So that's what you can get from Kenneth Koch. Two different skills and definition and example to use in your exploratory draft one, but also content information, learning about what rhythm is, learning about what sound is, learning about imagery from Coke. This isn't a complete definition that he gives us, uh, but it will get you started with some ideas. Um, let's move to Edward Hirsch and point out one additional skill that we see in Hirsch. If you remember from Hirsch, he kind of talks about how to read a poem. It's the title of his essay. And he gives this attitude and technique for reading. So he doesn't really fully get into writing and discussions about how poets make meaning. He's just trying to get us interested, get some curiosity and some basic tools for reading a poem. But what he does do, 
is focus on one of our technical skills, and it is the line, uh, or lineation. And it's one of the five technical skills. So where Koch talked about three, he talked about uh, imagery and sound and pattern. Hirsch is mainly talking about the line. It's one of the only things he actually addresses as a technical skill to learn how to write and read it. Um, and I want to just point out to you something that he does that will be another good way for you to develop your exploratory draft one. And this is also in terms of definition, mode of discourse. Um, in this section, he starts by defining lineation. This is called lineation, and everything before it is his definition of it. But then he goes on to talk about three different types of lineation. So sometimes when you're defining something, it's not good enough to just say, oh, it has just one overview definition. Sometimes we have to break down the overview into smaller sections. And he even says here, interplay between the grammar of a line, and he's also talking about the breadth of a line, and the way lines are broken out in the poem. It's almost like a thesis where he introduces that he's going to talk about three different types of line breaks. So what I call this is making distinctions in definition, that it's not just one thing. So when he says poets make meaning with lineation, he doesn't say what I mean by lineation is this. He says what I mean by lineation is this and this and this. So the three things that he looks at with lineation and the three things he defines are lineation by grammatical pauses. So how the line uh, uses and or creates tension against grammatical pauses. Um, he also writes about um, poets who use breath as a primary way to make line breaks. Um, he says, yeah, breath. Poets who employ unusually long lines, there may be another guiding principle, breath. And then he, he does have a metaphor here. Poets using words as music flowing through a horn, like a saxophonist. So we see metaphor form of definition here. That's after he's made the distinction from one type of line break to another. And then even here, he develops it with the metaphor. And then here is another paragraph where he's talking about line breaks by the shape, uh, just the visual impact. So it's another way to think about line breaks that he defines for us and that he explains how it works and how it generates an effect on the reader. I think that's going to be it for this video. Um, we can get out of here real fast. I think that'll be it. That gives you a couple fun foundational tools to use in your exploratory draft one. Using metaphor to define, choosing examples that both show that definition in action, but also are opposite. So using that contrast um, form to clarify what you mean by your claim, and also making distinctions and having each of those distinctions have their own definition, their own examples, so on and so forth. And then also, of course, you have the four areas, the four technical skills, four of the five uh, that our writers are talking about that might give you some direction on what these things are and how they work and what you want to say about them. So um, read these again. Learn from them, learn from the skills that they use to develop their ideas, their essay, and um, I can't wait to see what you put together, okay?